Hello everyone, welcome to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1 with Realism Overhaul and Kerbalism. Just a reminder, Realism Overhaul includes the mod's real solar system and real fuels, turning the stock Kerbal system into our solar system and giving engines realistic functionality. Kerbalism bundles life support, radiation, and random events. Obviously, this series will focus on efforts to colonize Mars, though I do intend to use the moon when convenient and send missions from Mars to Ceres, Vesta, and beyond. Hopefully. Eventually. Some of you have asked about my RP1 series, my career series, and I have to say that I simply wasn't interested in continuing that as I'd basically repeat exactly what I did in my RP0 Beyond History series, another career series. Uh, what I wanted to do was continue on with Mars exploration from the end of the Beyond History series, but then I had another problem. Most of the parts I wanted to use for Mars colonization, my own parts, USI parts, and Planetary Base Inc. parts, for example, have been configured for RO by me, and I'd be deciding the cost and where they fit into the tech tree anyway for RP1, because they aren't in the tech tree otherwise. So to simplify matters, I'm just going to play Sandbox. <laughs> and uh, the constraints that I'll face will be the rocket systems at my disposal. Basically, I'm only going to be able to use uh, rocket systems that I personally model. And uh, in general, it's going to be the Sagita rocket system that I detailed in the rocket science series. So basically, that's what I'm going to be going with for the most part. And when I need other parts, a lot of the time, I'm going to be making those in Blender. And hopefully, I'll be posting Blender videos where I show you how to make uh, parts for Kerbal Space Program in Blender. Uh, though they just updated Blender to 2.8. And so that complicates matters because I have to get used to that. Anyway, but the idea is I'm going to be uh, sort of adding stuff to this to help with Mars colonization. Uh, but the other constraint I have is that I'll be facing Kerbalism with all of its life support, the radiation, and random events. And so that will be, I think, enough of a challenge. So here we have um, Sandbox, difficulty options, uh, indestruct indestructible facilities. I'm not going to be using remote tech and uh, um, I guess I'll keep comm system for science transmission so we're not really doing science. Some of you might have wanted to do science mode but again I'm going to be placing the stuff in the tech tree anyway so I'll just pretend. Uh, it'll be fine. Um, I'll think about the whole comm system thing whether that's really a useful stumbling block or not. Kerbalism sort of requires some of that, so we will see. So GeForce Limits, I'll enable Kerbal Experience. Uh, KOS, I always start an archive anyway to save myself some trouble. Mostly I want to keep this flowing. I, I don't want to get bogged down by stuff. I'll readily, I'm already going to have to probably configure a lot of parts for Kerbalism. Hopefully the USI parts have been configured for it. I haven't double checked that. But um, yeah, uh, of course, my own parts I have to configure for Kerbalism. So, and I've done some of that already. Stress breakdowns, yeah, definitely. Uh, stress breakdown probability, let's set that to 20% for now. Um, lifetime radiation, I don't, I, I've uh, taken a look at how Kerbalism works uh, with the latest updates and in Realism Overhaul, and I'm okay with the radiation in general. I don't know about the lifetime radiation. We we will try it out, I think. Uh, maybe maybe we won't try it out first, and then once we see that it's okay, we'll try it out. How about that? That way we don't condemn any Kerbals ahead of time. Otherwise, I don't think I need to mess with anything. So uh, we have, we'll keep everything else the same. Storms, yes, there are solar storms as well. And we begin. I'm going to advance the date somewhat, and um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, oh, I should get RSS date and time in here. But for those who haven't met my rocket system, maybe I should just introduce you to the rocket system that I'm going to be basing a lot of this on. Uh, you will have seen it in the EDB Mission Control series. In a way, what I'm doing here is going to be what I intend to do there. 
but um, oh, I need to actually copy the craft file over from a different save. So I'd actually planned to make a new tech tree uh, for a career uh, mode that started in the year 2000. And well, I sort of tentatively named that RP2000. It's still a good idea. The player would play a SpaceX-like um, startup. But then again, I'd be setting all the parameters, so it's not a whole lot of fun for me. Um, it'll be good for other people to try it out. If I was going to do it, uh, it'll be like playtesting the system instead of just doing what you're supposed to be doing in Kerbal Space Program. So I'd be trying to bug fix that during the career mode instead of just going ahead and doing things that I'm supposed to be doing like colonizing Mars. Um, so that's why I decided not to go with that. But I'd still like to work on that uh, if I have the time. So this is the Sajita rocket with the ED4 engines down here. And um, these, these are my parts. And I think the only things on here that aren't are these little uh, retro rockets here. And the launch escape system and docking port and decoupler at the top. Other than that, this is the this is the core system with the pod. I've already configured the pod for Kerbalism, so uh, it's a little bit complicated because it's got an outer shell. This system is a little bit interesting. So we've got uh, this ED1 engine. I might tone the ignitions down. I might adjust this engine to be honest. And then the ED3 verniers, and then this is the decoupler, and then there's the heat shield. These are stock parts. This is the docking port. And then this is a forward shield. And then this uh, this spacecraft shell converts the this, which is actually a lander can. So this can be used. It's 3.4, uh, sorry, 3.141 tons right now. And we can use it with a lander stage like so. And this was uh, the first thing I designed in the rocket science series. So all the numbers were worked out in there. And otherwise, it has the scrubber, humidity controller, and pressure controller. And we can see the stats for that for Kerbal uh, Kerbalism. And altogether, it's meant to last for 14 days. We take a look here uh, 14 days of food, water, oxygen. Nitrogen for the pressurization, lithium hydroxide for the CO2 scrubber, and we're not using any of the other things. So it says they can last for quite a while in here, but the comfort is going to be poor, so they're probably going to be stressed out. We'll see. We need to see how the functionality of this works with Kerbalism. Technically, uh, so I've got some radiation shielding here. I've got half of the shielding, as you can see. Uh, technically, the shielding is supposed to go on the shell. But that's all right. I, I, if it's a lander can, in which case it won't have the shielding, or it won't have much shielding, maybe a little bit, then uh, we'll just set it to that initially, since we won't be removing the shell in flight anyway. So either it's going to be the orbital version, which is like this, or it's going to be the lander can version, which is like that. It can carry four in total, but that's a little bit cramped. But for 14 days, it's probably all right. Uh, size comparison, if you haven't seen this before, that's the Apollo command module, so it's bigger than that. Uh, but the assumption is that we have lighter computers, lighter materials to be able to use in the modern era, and so it's a reasonable mass um, once it has uh, the heat shield on. It's 7.183 tons. So I figured that's a pretty decent mass for a pod these days. It's not carrying seven like the Dragon 2 capsule. It's mostly roomy. Anyway, so that's the system. And then uh, we've got a 1ED4 engine on the second stage. And then this is a heavy because it's got two extra boosters. The core Sajita just has one core, obviously, and five of the engines at the bottom and those are 1,000 kilonewton engines. And then if we add two more boosters, so that this has uh, four boosters and then the core, then that's called a Sajita Super Heavy, and that can do basically what a Falcon Heavy can do. 
So, but this is not intended to be a recoverable system. Anyway, uh, so uh, with that in mind, I wanted to get RSS date time in here and I'm going to take some time and I'm going to time warp to 1990, I think would be a good time to start things off. So I'll do that off the camera and then we'll pick things up and do our first launch, which will be a test of this system on a lunar trajectory. We're going to send it over to the moon, uh, capture around the moon and come back and see if everything works and nobody gets killed. Okay, so here we are on the launch pad with the Sagita Heavy and the Lynx spacecraft. And we've got Jeb, Bill, Bob, and Valentina, so all four of the originals in there. We are risking them all. And it's nighttime because I had to line up with the moon because we're planning to go to the moon and come back. I decided to time warp all the way to the year 2000. It is January 2nd in the year 2000. Uh, I've started off at January 1st, but I had to time warp for the moon. And uh, yeah, uh, the planets are probably not in the right place for the year 2000 because it's 50 years from the start date of the whole thing. And uh, uh, for for my planned RP2000 career mode attempt to recreate everything, I um, would have had to have placed the planets in the right location for the year 2000. I won't be doing that this time, but that's still a tempting thing to do to make sure that the entire situation starts properly in the year 2000. But right now our transfer windows are probably not where they would be in real life. So the Mars transfer windows and all. Speaking of which, I don't have transfer window planner, but let's just get on with this. Uh, let's use KOS to launch it because I have the launch script in here. I've already done some testing, but not complete testing, um, especially when it comes to the radi radiation shielding. I only tested it without shielding before. Uh, so, yep, there's lots to talk about. Let's just do it along the way. And so here is the Sajita Heavy and its uh, launch platform. Incidentally, the building doesn't have a collider. So if it decides to accidentally take a side step towards the building, it's not going to blow up. Uh, I didn't want that kind of pain and suffering. But all good so far. I do need to work on the plumes. Uh, they are my engines. I probably ought to fiddle around with that at some point. So, um, I forget if I mentioned this or not, but uh, the boosters are made up of a large 20 meter tank and then one of the tanks uh, identical to the upper stage here. So basically the engines are feeding from two separate sets of tanks. So there's a methane and oxygen tank in here and a methane and oxygen tank in there. Not the most efficient setup unless you want modularity. And in this case we do. Uh, this setup allows for there to be a extended core. So the core is operating at full thrust and it can do that because instead of having the smaller tank on top, it's got the full 20 meter tank on top. So it's got a 20 meter tank, 20 meter tank and that's how it lasts longer. And incidentally, uh, for our module, uh, for our habitat modules on the Mars transfer vessel, we're just going to be using, well, partly going to be using hollowed out versions of that tank. The second stage tank is basically going to be our uh, Mars transfer hab. And also a docking module too may happen. So same dimensions, basically sort of like a Skylab sort of deal, uh, but smaller. These uh, tanks are 3.66 meters in diameter, so smaller than the ISS modules. Of course, the as a station module, it'll be heavier, much heavier than these tanks, of course. I tried a good faith attempt to calculate all the stuff uh, for masses and everything like that. And uh, that starts, of course, with these ED4 engines. Right now you can see them operating at 342 seconds ISP and 1,000 kilonewtons of thrust. Uh, they are supposed to be gas generator engines. And uh, I did the math in the rocket science videos. Uh, somebody noted that the ISPs are probably a little bit too high because they are gas generator and not stage combustion and we should be losing some from the gas generator. But I've also retained their extra mass. 
when I did the calculations, I presumed that the turbo pumps were basically solid. So, and of course they're not. They're not just solid lumps. They have empty space in them, but that ended up giving these engines more mass than they ought to have, and that's still the case. So there's sort of a trade-off going on. And also, we don't have a separate, as these throttle down right now to the G-forces, we don't have a separate uh, gas generator exhaust. The gas generator exhaust is actually being passed back into the nozzle. So it's not like a stage combustion system where uh, the gas generator, gas, not gas generator, the generator exhaust is being put into the combustion chamber. Uh, still, I think uh, putting the exhaust into the nozzle probably saves us some of the loss in effic of efficiency. I don't know what the complicating factors of that are. It has been done. Uh, the dumping it back into the nozzle is a thing that happens. There's probably some complexity to it that I don't fully fathom. But even the F1 had that. The F1 wasn't a particularly efficient engine, uh, but that's because its chamber pressure was fairly low and they had to do all sorts of stuff in order to deal with the whatchamacallit, uh, combustion instability, so. So, yeah. That's a more complicated situation. Okay, we're getting ready for booster separation here. And shortly after, we'll have the launch escape system go. And off they go. Well, that's one nice thing about uh, creating your own parts. Uh, you can integrate the decoupling system pretty well into the tanks. <laughs> uh, these guys are rolling a whole lot more. Well, I think that's mostly flashiness. Or... I don't know, it's weird. I don't know what to make of what's going on there. Anyway, we've got a launch escape system jettison. And yeah, it's rolling about a lot more than I would like it to. But... The usual way to stop that is with SAS, and I feel like KOS is sort of having a little bit of more trouble controlling this when I turn on SAS. It might be alright. We'll leave it be for now. Uh, so I did put the vessel mass at the bottom there so that you can track uh, how heavy things are, perhaps. I should have gone over that in the VAB, but... We'll be using this system quite a lot, obviously, and this will be a standard uh, spacecraft for us. That saves me a bit of trouble adding a whole bunch of extra mods to pick from stuff. That's one thing about the career mode. Uh, you have to dump in a whole bunch of mods so you have a good selection. Well, uh, if this is our launch system, these are our engines. I don't have to put a whole bunch of engine packs. It saves me uh, some, some potential room in the install in favor of doing other things, um, especially modules for the surface. Instead of just launching rockets all day, we can fill the install with payloads. Anyway, this operates at, uh, well, that's not the right one. It actually has two modes, and apparently it did not switch engine mode. So um, it has to switch, uh, it has the mode that it runs at when the nozzles retracted, and then this mode when it's extended is seven, uh, 373 seconds ISP. Not as good as a Raptor engine, but probably maybe a little bit better than it ought to be, to be honest. It's got a really big nozzle though. <laughs> uh, we'll go with that. So I have arbitrarily assigned ignition counts to it. We probably won't, I mean on the first stage engines we probably won't be igniting them more than once and this one probably not more than twice, so unless I get really creative. Uh, the RCS thrusters on the side run on methane and oxygen as well at a 343 second ISP. Uh, they're only 100 newtons, so they're not very powerful at all. The reason they're as big as they are is because they operate at 20 PSI, a very low chamber pressure. That makes them more reliable as far as I could tell. And um, yeah, so that's why I've got them like that. They're ignited by electric charge, um, so a very simple sort of situation. 
And we, I, I forget if I put uh, MLI layers, insulation layers on this upper stage, but we definitely have 40 layers on the service module because in the rocket science uh, series, that's exactly what I put. I put 40 layers on of MLI. So that's already built into the mass of the module. Okay, well, that program has ended. We'll have some delta V from here to do the translunar injection, uh, but a little bit will be necessary from the service module. I haven't really figured out what the optimal balance between the two is. Maybe I should carry some less fuel here and more fuel down here. I mean, not more more fuel, but to rely more on this to provide a delta V since it's a uh, better efficiency. But it's only slightly better efficiency. It's uh, 373. The main engine on here has a 360. It's got two verniers that operate at 351 though. Now. Uh, it's interesting, I put 10,000 electric charge in here, uh, but something has gotten rid of that, even though it was there in the VAB, and we've got megajoules here. Now, so what I guess has happened is that KSP Interstellar has done that, eliminated the electric charge and put the megajoules. And the reason I have KSP Interstellar here is not really to use the parts yet, not for a long, long time, but rather because the plugin allows me to time warp with the ion engines. There is also a persistent thrust mod which is separate, but I like the way KSB Interstellar handles the power a little bit better. As when we go behind bodies on the dark side, it handles the power much better. So I, uh, I decided to try that out. I only have one engine configured for it and that's from Lackluster Labs and that's the ion engine that I plan to use for the Mars transfer vessel. So we'll see all that later on. First, uh, we are going to figure out how to use this. So why are we going to the moon if this is all about Mars? Well, because I'm basically going to be parking my Mars mission in a high orbit and maybe around the moon sometimes because uh, that makes it easier to get into and out of. And so we need a way to get crew to a Mars mission part in a high orbit. And that's what this is meant to be. So the Sagita not heavy would be enough to carry a somewhat lighter service module and this, uh, the spacecraft into low earth orbit. The Sagita heavy is designed specifically to launch this to the moon. So I worked out all the numbers. It's supposed to be pretty spot on. But we are carrying some other stuff here. Uh, we are carrying, for instance, the, um, whatchamacallit, shielding for the radiation. Now, from what I've seen, the shielding is about what I expected it to be. It, uh, I, I basically approve of how much mass it seems to be taking. This is what I expected. So, as far as I could tell, people got their numbers right, and that makes me happy. So here's our transfer. Three days, ten hours sounds good. And we are going to uh, witness the awesome might of these RCS thrusters. Oh, uh, we don't want to have those on right now. And I am joking, of course. On the bright side, they don't use a whole lot of methane and oxygen. So I had made this into a methane oxygen system because I wanted it for Mars and to refuel on Mars and stuff like that. But I'm actually leaning these days more towards Hydrolox. Um, you can still refuel Hydrolox on Mars. The problem is storing it. But maybe that's not so bad, um, especially if that's what they're going to be working on with the moon, right? I mean, I guess uh, I presume that effort is going to be put into storing hydrogen when it comes to the moon missions. Hopefully somebody's working on that. So yeah, if they work on that, then, and if we have a system for that, a zero boil off system for hydrogen, then it might not be so bad to just uh, do a unified hydrolox system, in which case you can use it for both the moon and Mars. Uh, so now one part that I have modeled, uh, if you have seen some of my videos, is the blue moon that um, 
Blue Origin has made a mock-up of. They haven't really done anything with it or tested it fully. But this is taking forever to turn, isn't it? Um, add to adjustment. Max stopping time 20, uh, 12, sorry, 12. Uh, I might have to tune that down later. Anyway, so I have a blue moon in here because that is a part that I have made. So we may use that. And we'll be testing ISRU on the moon anyway. So I plan to use that to help us test ISRU systems. No point launching the system all the way to Mars. We're still beholden to launch windows. I should put traject uh, transfer window planner in here. But we still have to wait for transfer windows to do anything. And mostly that'll be probably just time warping through the time since we have a focus. But we'll need to send a probe over to Mars to scan for resources first. That's probably the first priority uh, on the next window, but maybe we'll send an ISRU unit too. We'll see. Something to drill for water and convert it. I don't think I'll need very long to do this, just like the upper stage of the Falcon 9 is going to have a lot of thrust to weight ratio initially. Wish it had a stage time there, it doesn't seem to want to tell me that. And not there either. Uh, 20 minutes for some reason. That seems that's the burn time for this stage. I don't know why it's showing me that burn time. And it's sort of combined the delta V of this stage and the service module. I'm not sure why. Maybe if I separate off this decoupler. Well, that didn't help anything. Okay, 35 seconds is showing now. Okay, slow down. This does throttle. Sim uh, basically, it's meant to be a Mephalox version of the Merlin 1D. That's basically the idea. With an extendable nozzle. Okay, separation. <laughs> Overall, the delta V provided by this service module is about the same intentionally as the Apollo command module, uh, service module, Apollo service module, 2,800 meters per second with just the command module. It doesn't, however, first of all, it's got uh, more efficient fuels, but uh, second of all, it's also got no fuel cell. It's using the solar panels. And one thing we need to check is whether that's good enough. Right now we've got electric charge draw of 2.16 kilowatts. And, but our uh, solar panels aren't very well oriented. Now that's another problem. Uh, for some reason, even though the, this module was doing its electrical power thing properly in 1.3, it doesn't seem to be in this version. Um, the vector for recharging is sort of weirdly skewed. It's like there instead of directly on. So it's sort of like that, and that's weird. I don't know why. And it seems like a tighter cone than it ought to be. Like right now, I don't think these are operating at all. It says occluded by vessel, but that's technically not a problem. One thing I need to see is what kind of margins we have for a potential rendezvous around the moon, right? It's not just about getting there into orbit and getting back, it's about also meeting up with something. And the margins are pretty tight. Okay, well let's see, we've got 1,781, we need 800 to make orbit, and then 800 more to break orbit, so that leaves us with about 181 meters per second to actually make a rendezvous. So yeah, that's pretty tight, though Though uh, Mars mission part around the moon might not be in a tight orbit. They might be in a loose orbit, in which case it could be easier to meet up with it, or it could be worse. It depends on the timing. So we'll see. So our throw weight to 
the moon is 15 tons or so. So that's what we're looking at with the Sajita Heavy. Sajita Super Heavy can do more. Again, the Super Heavy is just two more of those boosters on the side. Sort of an Angara sort of deal going on with it, really. Okay, so solar power, right. Mm, looks like we will want to point further towards the sky. So I can't, because it's a skewed angle, I can't just use Smart ASS's, um, oops, wrong way. Smart ASS to orient it. But once we get a good orientation, we can have persistent rotation keep it, at least. So you can still see uh, not recharging, not recharging, not recharging. And then suddenly recharging, very suddenly, actually. I mean, possibly I've just done something wrong. Now, the pod is fairly plain right now, and I haven't really greebled it up or anything. And I'll contemplate doing that, but um, keeping it simple might be beneficial. You can sort of write in your own pod specifics. It's a generic pod, and it's not meant to be very distinctive right now. It's a proposal. Okay, we are recharging, that's good. You might wonder what the helium is. The helium is the pressure for this stage. And later on, um, first of all, I might want to cut out some of these ignitions. That's, uh, that's probably a little bit excessive. And I might want it to uh, sort of deplete some of the helium with each ignition. Would be a good thing to do, I think. It'll be sort of stand-in for the T-Tab. It seems like from the Apollo audio and what I found out through playing re-entry, that the pressure does get depleted, and that is a thing that limits how many ignitions it has. So we will have it do that, perhaps. Anyway, that's longer term. Right now, what we're interested in, and I'll turn the uh, RCS off. I think it should be all right. Could do a barbecue roll, but uh, what we want is to see our radiation belts which is what Kerbalism uniquely adds to this whole deal. And uh, part failures, though. Um, I, I'll have to figure out how to configure stuff, uh, part failure stuff for my own parts. I'll be complicated, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, we have good... Uh, oh, incidentally, um, with real fuels, I don't know if uh, Kerbalism as well, but you, you get oxygen from boil off of the liquid oxygen so as the liquid oxygen boils off we'll have more oxygen so even though we started with 14 days we've already got some extra and uh, no radiation yet or at least not more than uh, one percent and we've got half shielding and we're looking to see if we can survive a trip to mars right and back a mars trip is a thousand days altogether but most of the time, they're going to be experiencing much less radiation than they're going to be doing on this mission. Uh, but the total length of the mission is about 100 times the length of this one. So what we're looking at is the radiation, probably we don't want to see more than 1% if we want to survive a Mars mission with this kind of shielding. It's possible that heavier shielding will help and mitigate it further but right now the margins are so tight on this at least this pod can't take too much more shielding maybe our other habs can you can see when we topped off the electric charge it also replenished the megajoules which is a totally different thing with ksb interstellar but hopefully it'll help with the ion engines i sure don't want to sit through uh multi-week-long ion engine burn, and that's basically what it would take. So the question is, do we have enough electric charge for the nighttime side of the moon once we get into a tight orbit? That is a question. Now we have a 10-minute burn time there. We probably need about six minutes of it. And we take some time to turn. So. This should be good. Let's just use that. 
there's sort of an IVA for this, but not really. That's nothing I would... I mean, there's no dials or anything. It's just so that there's something in the windows so that we have a camera on them. These little guys take forever to sell the fuel down. Incidentally, if you're wondering why the service module looks like this... Um, oh, and I had I actually put the chairs in. <laughs> uh, you can see that. It's not just in the IVA view, but uh, I made sure that there was seating for four. And what, what happens is uh, they're actually on rollers so that they can turn back and reorient themselves and fold down. There's space. There's space, trust me. Uh, I actually set the dimensions to the rather large chair I'm sitting in right now. Anyway, uh, the reason why the service module looks like it does is because it's the solar panels, uh, the skin of it is basically wrapped directly around the lander stage that I designed in the rocket science video. So uh, you can see the, the curved portion on the outside of these tanks here is, is basically what these solar panels are placed on. Very tightly fitting. So obviously, Kerbalism is taking the place of TAC Life Support. I don't have TAC Life Support in here. First time in ages that I've used Realism Overhaul without TAC Life Support. And I imagine there are things that I probably need to configure to make everything work out. We will see. So far, so good, though. I don't know if I mentioned it, but the Kerbals cannot EVA right now. The crew hatch is there, but it's on the on the internal cabin portion and they would be blocked by this um, this shield this the shell so in this mode they can't EVA out through there that is one of the quirks right now okay that'll do so we are in a two hour and two minute orbit we have enough fuel to get back home we're currently 12 tons for reference and the question is how about our power so where's the sun there's the earth if it turns out that we don't have enough power to recharge for the nighttime side consistently I might have to add fuel cells to this in which case I should take up a suggestion that I think human person on twitch had made to create a methane and oxygen fuel cell. Okay, well, uh, we just missed the... As it goes from the worst recharge rate to the best. It's weird. That's promising. I mean, I, I guess, ideally, you want the recharge rate to, be, to exceed the depletion rate. The depletion rate is 2.18. So having it be recharge at 2 is not the greatest. And, oh, I, I can't have it that close to just not recharging at all, so I'll have to accept something more like 1.7, 1.8-ish, I think. Okay. Alright, and now we time warp and see. So, uh, we're starting off here, and we're basically at 59,000 something. We go around. I I thought I turned off the coming out of time warp when signal is lost. Let me see. Can I configure this? I need to configure this. Uh, signal, no. Please don't take me out of time warp. There, there are Kerbals on board. You should never be worried when there's a signal loss. And we'll, we'll go around again. So we're at uh, 57,000 here. Goes up, depletes. That depletion rate is higher than I expected. Hold on. Okay, so it seems like we're losing about 3,000 per orbit. But I thought the depletion rate was 2.18. Oh, oh, too far, too far, too far. Okay, but now it's 3.39. Huh. Is it because they need to heat themselves? Is that why? 
I wonder if it's because of the temperature. Well, that's the surface. It's not showing us the temperature right now. But does Kerbalism take into consideration we're in the dark, we're in the cold, and the pod needs to heat itself? And that's why we're taking more power when we're on the nighttime side? Because it is taking more power, and I definitely did not calculate for that. And it's taking about one extra kilowatt. I mean, we can go over to this side. And let's uh, tilt it so that it definitely does not get any power from the sun. You can see it's pretty consistent at being at 2.18 for the worst case scenario here. So it's actually about 1.2 kilowatts extra that it seems to draw on the dark side. Well, that is important. It looks like if we deplete at the rate of 3,000 per orbit, we can stick around for maybe 20 or some orbits, 24 orbits. That's not bad. That's about two days. That would be enough time to make a rendezvous, but it's not exactly what I wanted. Um, all right, but important information. Now let's go back. Wonder how that'll be at Mars, because I mean, even the daylight side won't be getting as much heat. Obviously, it won't be getting as much light for the solar panels either. But fortunately, this doesn't operate independently around Mars at all. <laughs> it's always it's always attached to the um, Mar uh, Mars transfer vessel, so. We don't have to worry about that too much. We have to worry about the calculations for the full Mars transfer vessel with its huge solar panels meant to power ion engines. And really, those should be more than enough for the Kerbal requirements. The ion engines, however, might not have... Well, I mean, those will just go with the normal Mars calculations. Uh, the amount that the life support takes will be trivial. Nominal initial mission is with four people. Later on, we'll see about larger things. I don't know why it has a red portion of this bar when we have enough delta V. And, yeah, I mean, MechJeb seems to know that we have enough delta V. Why does the stock thing have, have that going? I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, they're not that low, but yeah, I don't think we need to reserve any liquid oxygen at all. I guess that's more for fuel cell purposes. If we had a fuel cell, it would be rather important to know that liquid oxygen is low. Oh, that's too low. I'm gonna go with 60 kilometers. There we go. Uh, only 147 meters per second left. We're right now 9.7 tons. We do have descent mode on this spacecraft. There's an asteroid coming in. Is it going to do it? That's a whole other uh, goal. Yeah, 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 I think it smashed into Earth. There's another tiny one over there. Now... I think realism overall still rescales these to be larger. So pushing them around is not like it is in stock. Not so trivial. I haven't tried for a long time though, so maybe maybe they decided to unrealize them, realism them, unrealism them. I don't know. I doubt it. Okay, we are crossing the radiation belts again. Okay, well, let's see where we're at. Um, uh, not log, info. 1% stress, 1% radiation. Well, again, since we got most of our radiation just crossing the radiation belts, that probably means that we got much less than 1% just on the way during the trip. And if we extrapolate out to a Mars mission, that means that this might be 
Well, I mean, it's doable. It's certainly doable since we only have half the shielding. So good to know. We are go for Mars mission if we have shielding, which is appropriate. If we have light lifetime radiation on, then I doubt any of the Kerbals is going to make more than one trip, but right now we don't have lifetime radiation on. All right. Off it goes. And so there, that's how it looks. Uh, that probe is out of electric charge. That's fine. We have refilled our liquid oxygen tanks. Not quite. That's not quite what happened. Okay, uh, I can't really reach the inner cabin unless I click over here. Turn descent, turn descent mode on. And we are going to want to be negative. Oh, and I want that. Okay. And roll zero as well. One minor regret is that the way I oriented this when making it, it's sort of sideways. The windows are over here when we've got roll zero. So it's like they are, the curls are on their sides. Not thrilled with that, but it's okay for now. And of course the RCS thruster is actually poking through the shell, right? They're attached to the cabin itself and there are gaps in the shell for them. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Glad to see I remembered the parachutes this time. Good. Um, a previous time when I tested the Lynx spacecraft, I did not have the parachutes. The parachutes are of course not one of my parts so they are additional they are real shoots parachutes worries me a bit that the cabin is glowing red as you can see and also irritates me that the shell is not perhaps a you know a problem with the fact that we've got the thrusters poking through it i don't know Still, it should be safely behind the heat shield. But you know how when you attach a tank to a heat shield, it likes to blow up? I, that's basically why I had to make the heat tolerance of the cabin really high. Otherwise, I would have liked to... Oh, God, the overheat is really... Well, that's worrisome. But this is the nominal return. So as long as it can hold out on this, we're good. But still, I don't like to see it overheating. Okay, we need to roll to... Uh, they, for some reason, Smart ASS does not like to roll this. I've, I've, I know this already. So I'm just going to manually roll it. It doesn't have a huge amount of descent mode, as you can see. It's not a very serious lifting thing. But it'll be enough, I hope. Okay, so we're hanging out close to this level, burning off more speed. If you heard the Apollo 11 audio, this is lift vector down, I believe. And then if you want to go a little bit further, you go lift vector up, which we'll be doing soon. Just as soon as that apoapsis goes down. That'll be good enough. And lift vector up helps us to mitigate the g-forces for the next bit because we're gonna get increasing g's going down from here on. I don't know why Smart ASS has trouble with this. It's fairly easy to control. It's a bit weird. It might be the stopping time. Maybe I should just use the MJ Atu controller. It certainly seemed better before. There's a KOS Atu controller built in now and this hybrid one. I like, I mean, it's like, I, I like them for different times. <laughs> there's, there's times when the MechJib one is good, there's times when the KOS one is good. So I don't know, it's very complicated. 
I have no idea when exactly the hybrid one is good. It being a hybrid, is it hybrid in a way that properly uses them so that they play to their strengths or not? I don't know. So I, I added enough fuel in here to make sure that they, uh, it could go around if necessary if it uh, keeps low enough that its electric charge doesn't deplete, of course. Um, it's the, the propellant tanks are actually at the top here uh, for the command module. You can see the little bubbles here next to the parachutes. Uh, very often times they're actually at the bottom here uh, in the slot between the cabin. So if we highlight the cabin, you can see the cabin has a straight bit down there. So the propellant tanks are often in that corner and that corner kind of thing all around. And also that would be a good place to put uh, the, your nitrogen and um, possibly your water. Though since this is uh, meant as a standalone cabin as well, you'd have to at least put the nitrogen water inside and the oxygen too. Or, you know, I could leave it out actually. That's, we could attach little spheres to the outside of it. That, that, that might be something I'd do later to explicitly have the tanks that it's supposed to have. Very clearly indicated, the waste and wastewater tanks as well. We can arrange all that. Possibly need more waste and wastewater space. Though, you know, wastewater is easy to dump and they used to do it uh, all the time on Apollo. It's always great during the tapes when they mention the urine dumps and the fact that they have messed up the thermal the roll, the passive thermal protection. Okay, where are we? 10 degrees north, 98 degrees east. Maybe off the coast of India? I think it's off the coast of India. And they're dropping down. So PG is 4.5, which is pretty good for a moon return. Okay, I want to get at the parachutes. Let's try and dispose of the forward heat shield. I don't know if it'll work right. Uh, you can see the problem here. Oh, but it went off. Okay, we've armed both parachutes. Let's see what happens. Okay, we have pre-deployment as planned. We really don't need all the ablator. I wish it would ablate more and um, cool the cabin and not make it glow red, but I guess that might be too much to ask. I'll leave the ablator though. It seems like we're at an appropriate vessel mass. So I don't want to dump it and like, I mean, if I dumped it, I would probably have to make something else heavier just to bring the vessel mass up to what I think is about what it ought to be. So might as well just keep it as is. This is how much ablator uh, heat shield of this size seems to have in realism overhaul, so I just used the same number. Well, 5 meters per second, so the parachutes are a little bit strong. So this was a simple mission, though it could have gone wrong still. There was still a possibility for it to go wrong. But it validates our basic system. We are, re we are I was about to say reasonably buoyant, then it started looking like it was about to say, it's okay, it's okay, let's just recover quickly. So yeah, we have a system to do basic over launches with four crew, and now we have to build all sorts of other stuff. Um, I think the first thing we need to look at is ISRU. I might put that blue moon to use, or I could launch it on my own lander stage, we'll see. The thing is, my lander stage is methylox, and we can't refill methylox on, on the surface of the moon. So, well, we'll take a look at that in the next episode. Until then, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.